Hell of Black. It's the morning show, you know what I'm saying? It ain't uh, 5.45 in the morning this time, but you know, it's still, still the morning. You gotta get it when you can, get it how you live. Come on, making it shake. Hope y'all been enjoying this content, you know, this consistent content, this persistent content against all odds, you know what I'm saying? Making these podcasts. Ain't really against all odds, because we have a pretty nice setup. Well, <laughs> no, it's a good, we got odds, all man. We got odds, yeah. <laughs> my this, man. We, yeah, we it's ain't, against I don't know, I'm like, mm. It's been about Krumah having the right, you know what I'm saying, books behind prison walls and whatnot. Oh, yeah. But it's against all odds I'm, still because we up against what we up against. So, yeah, against all odds. Hella black. Yeah. <laughs> we got to have that historical understanding so that we don't make excuses as to why we can't do this. But this is. That's where I was coming from. I'm like, mm, nah. All right. It's, it's, you know what I mean? It's difficult to do, though. <laughs> I This is why I say, like, our podcast is the organizer's podcast because it's for the people who can relate to actually organizing and understand the role that this kind of like communication plays in uh, educating the masses and spreading the politic. Like this shit is not easy at all. No, you know? it's not. But it ain't, again, it ain't, uh, you know, it's not like the uh, the FLN who have to do a, you know, hijack radio broadcast and shit like that. It's not uh, the Panthers office being under siege and still having to produce the paper. It's not that at all. But we do have, uh, the our own unique you know struggles, struggles as it pertains yeah. to trying to make money to live build an organization and also create this uh well it's the in the form of content but again to spread this knowledge to share history to combat all the western propaganda and false stuff that's out there as it pertains to um uh, liberation for new africans formerly known as black people right so yeah and the way that y'all can support our struggle is by subscribing to patreon.com backslash hella black pod by liking subscribing and commenting on our youtube that's a new channel that we're really trying to build out i know over the years uh we have been very inconsistent with that but if you look at the way the organization has grown hey it's a fair trade-off but now as a result of the organization growing and us having multiple cadres it gives a boss and i the chance to uh, you know get a free hour to do these podcasts weekly and so we're trying to build that youtube channel out and so like subscribe comment help us build this as always it's uh, for the people by the people wouldn't be done without y'all and support our patreon it's a lot of patreons out there that get supported and all they do is talk about supporting all they say is they support movements they don't do nothing to build them they don't tell y'all what their proper program is they don't work to build the programs we know y'all know we got multiple decolonization programs running y'all know what organization we are uh accountable to y'all know what community we are accountable to uh what ideology we are trying to uphold so you know supporting us is supporting more than just Abbas and, Abbas and I is supporting the nation for real the new African nation yeah and we one of the few podcasts where there's direct programming attached to the podcast like we ain't just podcasting we ain't just talking we ain't just theorizing everything we're doing is trying to put this theory into action mm -hmm. is learning from the actions we've taken not the program to you know looking back at our actions that we've taken and uh, trying to evolve them and change them as the conditions change, you know what I'm saying? But we one of the few podcasts where the hosts and the producers, the editors, you know what I'm saying? The the whole shebang is directly tied to a cadre organization, a cadre organization that has programs. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of pro, uh, organizations out here. Not all of them have programs. They will they will consider their they consider books their book deals. Their P, well, I would say like you know you have people that do like. I guess like book clubs or political education circles. Um, you know, the media piece is a part of a program, but I just, it can't be the only thing. It can't be like, if all if all your organization does is create media, like how is this media actually impacting the material needs, the immediate material needs of the people? Like how does me watching a podcast, how does someone listening to this podcast uh, alone, how does this podcast alone materially benefit the people of Oakland? It doesn't to some extent, right? It might lead to some sort of fundraising, but it's this in collaboration with the Free Mobile Health Clinic, the garden, uh, or I should say the farm, the I would say for us, it's a, you complete, know? It's a complete unity. But some people it, only but, got just, some, you know, some would just be sector. like, ah, oh, yes. But that's, I mean, that was, if we go back to the beginning of Hella Black, you feel me, that we seen that own contradiction within the podcast. Like, okay, we're doing this talking, we're doing this theorizing, but we ain't doing this organizing. The podcast wasn't directly tied to organization. Then what would you? What do we do? We created People's Breakfast Oakland. For me, I realized. You know, so. that, 
I if, think that's super important because right now it's like a lot of people like organize, organize, organization, organization, join the organization, but that organization doesn't have any material material program set up in any new African, African or black community. It's just talking. It's just theorizing. That ain't gonna do nothing for revolution. Yeah. You gotta be outside in the community, building a material force in the community. That's what's worked in the past. Mm-hmm. So we'll suggest it, learn from the past, and put it into fruition right now in the current. I look at someone like, uh, or two folks like David Hilliard. Well, shit. I want to bring up the Black Panther newspaper as an example, right? You had like folks like Sophia, David, and uh, Emery, who all worked in production of the Black Panther Party newspaper, right? One of the most highly circulated papers of all time, especially from a revolutionary nationalist group, right? Um, and then you get these folks also working in the clinic, also running the free grocery programs, also leading the PE classes, right? Like they was doing more than just creating, more than just being artists, more than just producing content. Like they was, this was all a part of a larger program. And I think we have to get back to pushing, uh, cause art does play a really big role, right? Like the journalism is a really big role. Um, was it, Mumia was the journalist, right? Yeah, like journalism plays a all really of it big plays a huge photography. Role. All of it plays a huge role, but you that That's can't be the only thing you're doing. I mean, as Fanon say, it's combat literature. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But that has to be a part of what a, an organization, a cadre organization, or just not a part a part of an organization. But also, I think the because you can say, okay, let's say if, if all you do in the organization is solely write, it's like. My nigga, it's not it take that long to write these articles, to write a book. Like, y'all know you got some free time. Like, how about you come to the grocery program? How about you come to the free food distribution? How about you go feed the baby's breakfast? Like, you got you to gotta do more. And I believe that that, we talked about it in Revolutionary Art, that's the only way. One of, like, two episodes ago. Uh, that all ends to, I, I believe that our podcast is getting better as a result of our on-the-ground organizing, right? As a result of, like, yo, we're learning different ways to communicate these things uh, because we're seeing the woes of capitalist imperialism, right? Uh, we're seeing those manifest in different ways through our daily organizing. And your analysis is only going going to get strong by studying history then being outside in the current time to make sense of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you ain't going to have a... How can you have a strong analysis if you ain't outside with the people, if you ain't outside building? You know what I'm saying? That's how you get a lot of people who be stuck in 1960, stuck in 1970, but ain't actually... You know, having a, a strong analysis yeah. of the current. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think uh, the community is a classroom, right? So it's, yeah, we have these cadres we study internally, but getting outside in the program, that's where you're going to learn a lot as well. You got to read the books, talk about the books, build your ideology, but you got to get outside and uh, study with the program. Yeah, outside making hella noise. <laughs> a day in the life, man. Have a black. We could just. <laughs> Let's just pause till these niggas go by. I'm excited for this episode. I think it comes at a great time. We're going to be taking a look at neo-colonialism. Uh, and when two of our cadres, we're doing The Wretched of the Earth and uh, The War Before by Sophia Bakari, Wretched of the Earth by Frantz Fanon. And in this, I mean, throughout the book of Wretched of the Earth, neo-colonialism is a theme. And then in some of the chapters we were reading last night for The War Before, uh, neo-colonialism came up. And so I think as a cadre, you know, it's something we discussing. But then, you know, Cornell West recently announced his presidency or run for presidency. Uh, and, yeah, it just seems like it's a very uh, serendipitous time for us to be discussing neocolonialism on the podcast. Uh, because I've come to understand what Cornell West is doing as, you know, running for president is a containment strategy, which we'll get into a little bit later, which is a, a method and strategy of uh, neocolonialism. Um, but before we even, you know, we need to start with the definition of neocolonialism, but I think before that, we should also like start with colonialism is. Yeah, I mean, colonialism is about an alien, about a foreigner, about a foreign nation, uh, establishing control of a territory politically, socially, and economically, right, to where uh, the foreign nation, the colonial force, uh, is subje- subjecting that whole nation um, to the political, social, and economic and military control, right? So it's uh, stealing the land, stealing the resources in certain areas. You know, colonialism might look like uh, being centered in the areas where the resources are. So where they're stealing those resources, taking those resources out uh, to where that mother colony 
in itself mm-hmm. can, you feel me, <laughs> suck the resources dry uh, and expand its capital, right, for the mother colony, right? So we see the French colonizing where? Algeria, as well as <laughs> a numerous amount of, of African nations, mm-hmm. right? So if we look at uh, neo-colonialism, it's that evolution of colonialism, right? It's the uh, when a country might have all the quote-unquote uh, outward illusion, outward uh, uh, looks of independence, but in reality, it is still governed by the political, social, and economic control, um, either of the foreign colony, of that same foreign colony, or a new colony like America, right? Yep. So we've seen a lot of African nations getting their independence, and then the CIA, <laughs> they came in and were able to establish power um, and establish neocolonial control over these colonies, um, or o- over African nations, um, because Europe was still in shambles after World War II, yep. right? So then, sometimes people will just leave it at that. But I would say neocolonialism, especially if we're looking at ourselves, and this is why identification is super important, because if we identify ourselves as a new African nation and see ourselves uh, subjected as a nation, subjected under colonialism, subjected under uh, settler colonialism, meaning that uh, this alien force not only colonized the land, but then settled on the land um, to where they have political, economic, social, military control over the land like America or the so-called state of Israel, um, if we look at these these settler colonies, we understand that uh, neo-colonialism in the settler colony is the same type of uh, outward trapping of freedom, the outward trapping mm-hmm. of independence, this illusion of freedom, this illusion of independence. And what it does is it integrates uh, the new African nation, select people within the new African nation into the colonial force to do the job of the colonizer, right, to mm-hmm. where you have black cops, <laughs> Uh, black president, black vice president, uh, black people in government, right? You have uh, uh, black people at the head of these, you know, uh, very liberal uh, nonprofits, right? So it's the uh, integration of this colonized people into the colonial system to do the job for the colonizer, right? So it ain't the, you know, Fanon talk about the, the, the Western bourgeoisie versus the national bourgeoisie, right? So in the United States, you know, you have that, uh, Western bourgeoisie, the, the European settler bourgeoisie, which has then created what this uh, uh, national bourgeoisie, the so-called new African bourgeoisie, mm-hmm. which is really a quote-unquote bourgeoisie in spirit only because it ain't an authentic bourgeoisie because you don't own, you don't control. You're no a bourgeoisie, power. but you was getting, you was getting your money, you was getting your control, you was getting your power from the Euro-American uh, settler colonial capitalist imperialist system that's giving you the, that power. Uh, so that's how we would uh, see and define neocolonialism, especially uh, from the new African perspective. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what we is truly that is uh, the biggest obstacle to mm-hmm. national unity. If we're talking about the first phase of three phase theory, right? Class struggle for national unity. The biggest obstacle is neocolonialism. I say neocolonialism and ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Two big obstacles. Mm-hmm. A lot of people wouldn't identify the new African nation, uh, black people as being in a neo-colonial situation uh, because because of Western propaganda, uh, they presented colonialism, neo-colonialism as these, uh, you know, these phenomena that do not happen domestically, right? But again, when we understand that, uh, first is it's getting new Africans to identify as a nation, right? Like we aren't a part of this nation, period, point blank. So what Kwame Torrey always says, if if I'm American, why I can't do none of the things Americans do? If you look at the way that, New Africans have been forced to live on this land. Uh, the history coming from Chateau slavery, Jim Crow, mm. and the genocide that we are currently under, was that, does that sound like a person who has nationhood? That is a quote unquote American, right? That has uh, the ability to identify with a place and, and work to build it up. That's what, nas- that's what nationalism, that's what a nationalist is, someone who identifies with that nation and then works to build it up. That suffer that uh, not suffers, but is able to benefit all the from all the uh yeah have all the benefits that a com- that that accompanies being a citizen of a place and we don't have that well ask yourself why every other nationality right uh, or every other ethnic group you look at white americans from 1950 they've grown from 130 million to 240 million something like that hispanics have grown from 2 million to 60 millions uh new africans that went from 15 to 40. everybody else got this crazy exponential growth Double, triple, 
15 times. What we got? You know, so you look at the growth of the new African nation and what has happened. Yeah. And that's why the United States of America has been found guilty of genocide. If you want to ask yourself as a, as a black person, if you find yourself in a neo-colonial situation, ask yourself, does, is your life on a social, economic, and political level governed by your own interest? And then look at the masses of the people. That lets you know that you and are in a colonial situation. Who's, who, who, whose culture is this? We talked about this on, the, on our episode with Q that's about to come out soon, but like, whose life are we living? Is this how you want to live? I, I already know the answer to that, no. Ask yourself listening to this pod. Is this, is, this your, is this your social, economic, and political interest, the way that this country functions? If you say no, you new African, colonial subject, neo-colonial subject. If you try and exercise control, what's going to happen? <laughs> Let's say, like, hypothetically, you try and exercise, like, you don't want to buy into any of this shit, and you just want to do what you want. What's gonna happen? Like if you, you don't, like if you don't pay taxes. Oh yeah, I'm like, I mean, you gonna <laughs> you be know, dead you know or in jail? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, or living on the streets? No, like, you, you don't get to reject you. this. You don't get to reject this world. Not without an or- organized mass body, which you is know? what we're trying to build here. We're trying to have <laughs> mass rejection. You don't get to choose. You know, with a real ideology. If you, you have know? a job, you don't get. But hey, no, I'm just gonna come in late every hour. hour. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you don't have control. Neo-colonialism presents. If you ain't pay your water bill. What's gonna happen? You, know you ain't pay your light bill. You don't have control. It's it's the farce <laughs> uh, of freedom. Yeah. That's it. You was talking a bit about its historical development. Can you dive a little deeper for all the listeners in terms of the historical development of neocolonialism? Yeah, well, you know, most people would start at the post, quote unquote, post colonial period, which they would say is. Well, see, some people would say the colonial period is what the Berlin Conference up until uh, the end of World War II, right? So 1864 to 1945. I would personally argue that the colonial period started the minute we started selling Af- other Africans. From there, we were no longer acting in Africa's uh, social, economic, and political and military interests by expatriating, by sending off uh, millions of our own. I, I would say the colonial period started... 15th century, the moment niggas started engaging with with Europeans and selling slaves, right? Um, Or 16th century, 15th century, yeah. Um, And so if we know the end of the colonial period to be the end of World War II, this is where you see uh, a few factors leading to neocolonialism, right? Uh, One being the consciousness of the African masses rising up, right? So here in the so-called United States, you had, I believe, like a million uh, new Africans serve in some form that are on the, of the armed forces, right? And then also in the in the the uh, Allied powers of the colon- of the colonizers, like the French, the British, right? Um, the French, the British, who else? And then you had like Belgian forces. You had like uh, Africans fighting with the Belgians too. So you had like a, you had like two million Africans across the diaspora fighting in this World War fighting in World War Two, and for them to re- it's, it's about liberty and liberating people, right? It's like we got to save the Jews from this fascist, from these. Uh, we got to save the Jews, right? That's what it's about. We got to stop. We got to establish democracy. And so, as Africans, you like, damn, we saving these people. We putting our lives on the line. But look at how we living in the Congo. Look at how we living in uh, Ghana. Look at how we living in Guinea. Look at how we living in Zambia. Look at how we living in R- Rwanda. Look at how we living in Texas. Look at how we living in Louisiana. Look at how we living in Arkansas. So I can go and fight these wars, but establish democracy other other places, but I don't got shit here. The colonizer realizes real quick, like, oh, shit, these niggas is realizing we on some bullshit. If we want to, especially on the continent, if we want to continue to milk this place for all its resources, we have to shift. That's what fascism is always going to do, right? Fascism is going to do whatever it needs to do to uh, keep a stranglehold on the economy and to establish white supremacist capitalism. So if that means I got to give you a black president... I'm gonna give you a black president. If that means I gotta give you an Independence Day, I'm gonna give you the black. I'm gonna give you an Independence Day. If that means I gotta give you a flag, I'm gonna give you a flag. That means I but gotta I'm give still you going on. <laughs> if I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you Juneteenth, the national holiday. Juneteenth should be accompanying the masses of black folks having some sort of uh, exponential growth in, in their material reality, some so, a, a, a increased quality of life. Bro, I was in the gym on Juneteenth, and it was just like the normal time I go is usually like an off hour. And it was just hella Europeans in there working out. I'm like, man, but you had the black folks in there Don't working. get me started, because somebody said they couldn't do something for us because it was Juneteenth was off and they was not black. But, you know, 
regardless, that's neither here nor there. Regardless, like, so you have these things, right? You have World War II sends Africans across the diaspora fighting to us to save uh, Jewish people and to establish democracy across the world. They come home, they realize I fought, I've died, and look at how we still living across the continent, across the U.S., uh, across the South and the so-called United States. And the, the, the colonial forces say, yeah, we got to give these people something before they fucking bear arms against us. Uh, so this is where, but with that comes what Kwame Nkrumah calls neocolonialism, right? He says they give you the black prime minister, the black president, uh, but who still owns the natural resources, right? And then the United States, them being a place that says, look, we don't have any colonies. That was their whole message throughout World War II. We don't have colonies. This is the land of the free, the home of the brave. We Life, liberty, the and the pursuit of happiness. Revolution. You feel me? Like, we, we, this is, we, we know, we, was, we, we support y'all. We did the same thing. We broke free from Europe. Right? So the United States becomes a, simultaneously, you mentioned it earlier, right? Uh, Europe is in shambles because of the war. Like, socially, economically, politically, on a military level, right? They're like literally broken. And this allows America to establish themselves as a global power especially a power in industry. So what happens here in the United States? All these jobs, right? You get like General, Mot General Motors, right? All this industry is here, and that allows that. Uh, because don't forget, when the white working force left from America to go fight the war, who stepped into these places? This is how you get legacy workers at Longshoremen and shit, right? That's how we started working at the ports. Uh, and then, so you get black folk, a black workforce built out of World War II. Niggas ain't about to just go back to not having no jobs. Boom. United States is able to gain power as an industry. You get Ford Motors, all these different industrial things coming over here. Now the United States is leading global economics. So what the port's growing even larger. Now there's even more jobs coming there. Uh, white people are moving up in their ranks. So now they can afford maids, et cetera. So now black women are now ex uh, put into the workforce, right? All these things are a byproduct of neocolonialism because it seems like what? Like black people are moving up. That's what it is, the sham independence under the guise of like integration. Then and then all that capital that is being made is doing what to the, the continent. You know what I'm saying? Through through loans and all you know what I'm saying, the the, the quote unquote economic development of Africa. Africa then becomes uh into a neocolonial situation. Yep. Here again is that dialectical unity between the oppression of new Africans here in this land they call America and the oppressions of Af the oppression of Africans on the continent. Because where are they getting the tantalum, <laughs> the cobalt, the bauxite to make these cars, these televisions, these phones? It's coming from the continent. But these are all the things that allow uh, folks in the United States, because even the white worker is feeling like they get gaining up. We in, they in manager positions and all that. Like, nigga, no, you're still being exploited. The capitalist still has this reserve, this huge, vast amount of wealth. All right? And then you even look at situations like Ghana, uh, they had, like, the head of their forces was British. You look in the Congo, the Belgians were the head of their military. This is so how you, you have get... these nations, quote unquote, getting independent, but then the military officials are still the head of their military. Then look at the civil servants. Then we look at, you feel me, the intelligence agencies using those military officials because what are they? They ain't no. Ghanaian military who's working, who's working in these embassies? Who's working, working in the hospitals? Who's working? It's not Af like so. Things aren't really quote unquote nationalized, right? It's not really uh, you know the, the nationals of these different countries running them. It's still it's what it's a neo colonial situation. Like yeah, you got a president, you got you might have majority parliament, all these different things. But nigga, you got the it was a Union Mineral was the mining company, the Belgian mining company in fucking uh in the Congo. Still owning, deciding where these natural resources go. They're still setting the markets. They're div they're divvying up the markets. They're setting the prices. Is that okay, a boss? You get to have all the rooms in the house, but I actually own the house. Are you, like you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, running bro. around like it's my house. <laughs> or a nigga like you get to live on the farm, but I tell you what crops to grow. I set the I set the market. I set the price for the crops. I say where we where we gonna distribute, nigga. You ain't. But hey, I run the farm, though. No. You don't have real freedom. And that's what was happening in the neo-colonial situation. We had all these different African nations uh, getting their independence day, getting their flags. But when it came to playing in the, in the world market, they didn't have much, much power because you had the European Union and America running everything. Then you get projects like post-World War II. This is when NATO pops up. This is when uh, the United Nations pops up, formerly the League of Nations. But because of America's power, they're able to say, nah, we shifting all of this and bringing it right over here to, right to here, America. Right here to the settler colony. <laughs> we won't bring Right here to New York. Right you know here what I'm on, saying? on indigenous The World land. Trade Organization. All these things are uh, 
these shifts start to happen post World War II, and this is a byproduct of neocolonialism. And we have to understand neocolonialism uh, as a containment strategy. And I would say, like, you know, talking about Cornell West as a containment strategy, you know, me, you, and well, I was talking to Q about this, and then me and you was talking about it as well. Think about we've we been talking about Cornell, but think about how much <laughs> money is going to be used to fundraise for his campaign over these next few years. Money that could actually be millions going to, upon millions of dollars are going to go to him just for Cornell West to end up doing exactly what he did the last election. Doing the exactly last what election, Kamala, what Kamala Harris just did. The last oh, election, I didn't win. Did go vote for Biden. Go vote for Biden. Go vote for Bernie. Is what Cornell That's West what, did. You feel yeah. me? So he he did the whole thing for. Bernie Sanders was a Zionist imperialist. He was a surrogate, a national uh, type of spokesperson speaking on behalf of uh, Bernard Sanders, Bernie Sanders, a Zionist. And then what does he do? Okay, Bernie loses. And then what does Bernie do? Bernie said, okay, yeah, Joe Biden. What does Cornell West do? He does, okay, Joe Biden. So the same thing that's going to happen in this election is he's going to get the, as a containment strategy, and we're seeing it work. We're seeing... People who align themselves with revolution and quote unquote uh, abolition and quote unquote. I mean, Cornel West freedom. called himself a revolutionary and an abolitionist, <laughs> but that's why I'm like, well, like he needs but to that, define. But, but that's that, like, but that's the containment strategy because exactly. you use the language of revolution, but in reality, what are you? You are a neo-colonialist. You're a neo-liberal. Even all the criticisms you have of it, you function on the foundation of neoliberalism. You were for empire, even though you can say, "Oh, the empire is doing this." Even though right. he quote unquote supports civil and human rights, but he, he didn't say. Like, I'm like, I don't. I, I watched a whole probably hour long interview with him, and I could not tell you what, based off that interview, what his ideology. Was. I mean, I, I I can tell you what his ideology is based off my own analysis, right? But like, he keeps saying his first thing was like, we're attacking fascism, we're attacking the empire, and all he says is what he supports. But what does that material support look like? You know, he name dropping Jamil Al Amin and shit. It's like I went to see how much he's talked about. Jamil Al Amin over the course of the years, and I found one birthday post. You ain't com- really campaigning, and these neo these neo these neo colonialists uh, who use neoliberalism as a method to have their own success in this system. These black ones for show, these legacy niggas, all they gonna do is name drop because that that does something for us. You name Kwame Ture, you talk about what, what the work you did with with Martin, you talk about uh knowing Jaleel Al Amin when he was known as H Rap Brown and the Snick and all that. You feel me? It's like, bro, it's but that's what bro, that's what they do. Neo-colonial agents, they I mean, they use, they use they the race use, card. Yeah, they love to use quote it. Quote unquote race and no race ain't real, but like they use mm. black is in that's how they I mean because they know people buy into it and what they're doing is they tricking the left. They're tricking the quote unquote, whatever the black left is, whatever that means. You know what I'm saying? Now they're getting people back into quote unquote talking about what? Electoral politics. Getting people to talk about what? The presidential election. Because guess what's going to happen? Are you referring to you saying like they're getting black left to talk about these type of things? Yeah. I would argue that those people who are doing that are neoliberal. If we know, I will call them fascists myself, because if we know fascists to be uh, a belief in practice, that does whatever it needs to strengthen rights, white supremacist, capitalist imperialism. The the fact that at any given moment you swinging yo politics, like what do you call that? Uh, so you gonna do whatever you know, profitable. That's what fascism does, I right? I said the, the so called black left because these are the people who I would say take up the quote unquote space of oh we is the leftist, we is the black left, whatever. That's why I said whatever that means. It's, they, they on the same four Whatever year cycle. That means, because when I'm gonna push this shit until the presidency comes, the presidency comes, I'm gonna push electoral politics. When that electoral politics shit happens, I'm, I'm gonna go back to this radical. It's bro, it's just like pendulum. You feel me? Because why is it the pendulum? Because there's a bag associated with it, and that's what they do. Whatever there's quote unquote fame associated. If it's with money it. pushing radical shit, they're gonna push the radical. It's shit. Quote unquote, if it's money being, pushing the liberal shit, they're gonna push the liberal shit. Come on, and we have to be able to identify exactly what is going on because this is happening over and over and over again. And here we are getting fooled with the same damn okie doke time and time again. But who are they really fooling? Because who's we talked about this in Cadre last night. They say that no, I was looking it up. Uh, New Africans account for 13% of the voters in the so-called United States. Now, I'm curious, like, what is that demographic of the 13%? It's probably going to be the same middle class, because you got to think, like, if you got a felony, you can't vote, right? 
some or states like it's a, shifting, yeah, but yeah, you I know, mean, it's like it's a lot of things that it's not the masses of black folks who are voting. So like, who are you really fooling? You fooling the niggas who been getting fooled the, for the last? But you know, but that's I mean that's a significant amount significant, of our people. Yeah, if, if, if that, we talk but, about class struggle too, we need those yeah, people. Yeah. And, and uh, but that's what they're looking at. They're looking at these percentages. You know what I'm saying? Like they're looking at these percentages. They're looking at what gets these people to vote. You know what I'm saying? Because uh-huh, uh-huh. that's what it really is about, right? Because yeah, you're, you're just seeing shifts. Might be you're you're like seeing divesting. shifts in the black vote, yeah. right? So what does the state come and do? You know what I'm saying? With their containment strategy is, okay, we're going to attack it from multiple levels. Let's get this old civil rights Negro to run for president, to you know use that type of... Uh, language you know what i'm saying cornell west he he he's a he's a good speaker i'll give him that to some degree right he has he's that smart as hell. he has that orator he's you feel me he has too. that uh southern type of preacher aspect right so what are they really looking for though right now the democrats right they're looking for that black vote in the south that's what they're doing you feel me like they trying to get the the south they're trying to get that vote so what are they doing they're deploying cornell west to get people uh Rowdy up or get get people excited about voting. All these damn Euro you feel Americans me? And then what is he gonna do? He's gonna be like a fucking uh, dog, uh, curtailing a whole bunch of fucking lamb right into the Democratic Party. That's what he is. He, he's a, he's a, a shepherd. I mean, look, <laughs> and he's gonna put that whole vote. His whole thing now is like he, he was calling he was calling Obama a puppet. Then you look in 2012. He says I'm gonna vote for Obama. I don't agree with his shit, but I'm gonna vote for him. Okay, if you really just divest it and understand. If you die, if you that divested from the system, why have you not done anything to organize the grassroots masses? What he program have you put together for the masses? This there's shit that you could be doing every four years, and I ain't talking about the I ain't talking about the little charity event. I'm talking about like actual programs to educate and provide for the masses. Because I still don't know what his program is. I actually don't know what his plan is. He says, "Oh, we need to defund NATO. We need to de- defund Africom. How many bases are you talking about closing and when?" And we un- we know that defund means what. Don't mean and you know he ain't gonna say shit about he ain't gonna say shit about rid of. he ain't gonna say shit about Israel throughout this whole campaign because who paying who who paying for them campaigns who paying for his who for his shit <laughs> them Zionists he ain't gonna say shit he ain't gonna say shit about Israel right, or he right, said yeah. before he said that I believe that Palestine and Israel can uh, can coexist or some shit like that no I understand if if Israel exists Palestine is not free Israel isn't real it's not a real place <laughs> <laughs> it don't exist right so like these are these are his things, and it's the type of stuff we got to be. But at the same time, of. they'll say, "Oh, we need justice for Palestinians." That's what he'll say. Yeah, he said, but they, "I believe they can coexist." Yeah, but he said, "Ah, oh, but coexistence between my my Jewish brothers and my 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 Muslim brothers and sisters and uh, <laughs> so man, get out of here." But sometimes we just we have to look at it for what it is, be able to identify this, but also like look at like I saw people like, "Oh, because of you know," if you listen to the Bricks episode. People have this delusion to where they think like the empire is just gonna magically fall. But every time Europe is in crisis, anytime Euro America is in crisis, they respond to crises very well. If that that that's one thing we should look at, you know what I'm saying? You got to sometimes credit it. I said sometimes that containment shit, like from a <laughs> the way they have it, sometimes like it's that shit beautiful in terms of it's destructive, it's ugly. But the way they it's efficient, the efficiency of it, because every crisis they've had, they've been able to make that crisis and make the empire stronger. So, again, we see neocolonialism as a uh, that, that colonial versus neocolonial phase. It, it was it was a crisis. And what do they do? They say, OK, we are going to we can't sh- have the same type of strategy. They adjusted their strategy to have full economic, political and social and military control of the continent. Same thing happening here. We have uh, if we look at integration in the time period. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, we need to we need to quote unquote integrate as a containment strategy so that revolution doesn't happen. What happened? Fast forward to 2020. They had a whole containment strategy launch, PPP, all you know what I'm saying? Basketball game back on, and they said, oh, we have Kamala Harris, we have Joe Biden, and people was around parading. That again was a containment strategy. So every single time Europe is in crisis, they have figured out a way to contain rebellion. Mm-hmm. And it's psychological. It's a psychological warfare. That's why we have to be able to identify exactly who is for us and who ain't. That's why race ain't enough to unite on. If race was enough to unite on, look at our people. We all we all say hey, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Mm-hmm. Barack Obama ain't our kin. <laughs> Kamala Harris ain't our kin. And guess what? Cornell West ain't either. 
He does not believe in new African independence. He does not believe in the unification of all African people. He does not believe in Pan-Africanism. He does not believe in egalitarianism. He does not believe in communalism. He's against, he says he's against the empire. He's for the empire. If you against the empire, why are you running for president? Last time I checked, a president is the head of the empire. Unless he just, you know, plans to get assassinated. <laughs> Which... Man. He 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 planning. He ain't even gonna get elected. This is all. That's that's part of it. He ain't, he has no plans to actually be the president. He's no plans at all. He's being an opportunist. The Democratic Party is using him as a puppet. He's not being used. He's he's well aware of it. Oh, he knows. Yeah. He said, "Okay, let me be, a, let me be used. Yeah, <sighs> let me be a prostitute for the Democratic Party." But he's using it for his own economic gain, and that's what. So he's a part of the national bourgeoisie. Folks have to realize this all <laughs> comes down to economic subjugation. From an economic system, all aspects of life are birthed, right? And so if you want to understand neocolonialism as a economic, that's political subjugation, I'm going to give a stat from like 1965. This is a stat that shows up in Kwame Nkrumah's book, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. So in 1965, Africa accounted for 8% of the world's population. That's a lot higher than the United States of America, period, point blank. Um, but they only accounted for 2% of the world's GDP. So ask yourself how the, one of the, the largest continents in mineral-rich places in the world accounted for 2% of the GDP. Because who, who, who owned the factories? Who owned the industry? The raw materials were getting took, taken and produce somewhere else and then sold back to them, right? In present day, Africa has nine countries on the top 10 poorest countries in the world list. The US has the world's highest GDP, over 23 trillion, right? Like 23.1, 23.2. Uh, while the Democratic Republic of Congo, being the largest producer of cobalt, the shit that, has, that allows our phones to work, our computers to work, planes, Cars, right? It can be found anything. Has a GDP of fifty-five billion. Uh, the United States produces like they have like nine. They produce here ninety-six thousand metric tons of bauxite, right? Which is a mineral used to uh, make aluminum. We know we can look around our house and see where aluminum is. You can walk outside, we see where aluminum is. Uh, Guinea. So the United States produces ninety-six thousand metric tons, right? Guinea has a reserve. Of seven, was it seven billion metric tons of bauxite? Of bauxite. How does the country have all these resources, all these natural resources, but has no wealth? Because who 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 dominates the industry? Uh, it's they aren't trying to develop Africa in a sense to where the masses of the people can can gain the skills to produce industry, right? If industry is just a process of taking a raw material into a final, why are they out there mining cobalt, tantalum, and bauxite, but can't produce the cars, the phones, the planes? We was we was in, we was flying in the continent. You know them planes from the eighties. You know them planes from the eighties. The same the same materials in the seats from the eighties probably from you feel me? Like that they bought them from an old European airline. You're producing all the bro, you got uh, But you can't have an airplane without it. <laughs> I mean, you even look at uh, Ghana, Ghana and chocolate, <laughs> coffee, all in the Ethiopia. chocolate, all the coffee, but then it has to be exported. And you got a place like Sweden being the biggest <laughs> exporter of chocolate. I mean, you got the United States making all these money off natural resources, but they don't even have the materials on their own soil. How does someone else get the, what? That you you ain't finding large, you ain't finding seven billion metric tons of bauxite. In the United States, I just told you the ninety six thousand is what they produced. It ain't in Utah, <laughs> nigga. Zambia is three in in a production, top three in production of copper in the world. Their GDP is twenty two point one billion. In the U.S. is twenty three point two trillion. They don't produce bauxite. They don't produce tantalum. They don't produce cobalt. They don't produce copper. They don't produce more coffee than Ethiopia and Uganda. But yet they have so much more money. How does a 
You gotta. That don't make sense to me. It's a superstructure of capitalist imperialism. Neocolonialism is what's boosting it all. We have to get control economically. We we have to. Even if even if you look at the the workforce here, right? New African workforce here. Look at how much time folks spend making these capitalist money. What you can't give me one excuse that says that the average Amazon worker driving these packages should make that much less than Jeff Bezos because what he had the idea. What. We talked about this with the cats, with the with the students at Pitt. It was like, well, if I had the idea, I'm like, so if you have the idea, that means for the rest of time, you were the oligarch, you were the king, you was in control, and then you get to exploit all your classroom or all your classmates. Does that sound fair? No, nah, you're like, yeah, nah, you're right. right. <laughs> but that's because he what had a human connection to his people. Yeah, I mean, because they in there shaking hands, and, and this ain't they, just they, they, they it, this was stuff, this is Latinx talking about new Africans and Euro Americans. And Asians, they're like, no, nah, I wouldn't want to oppress none of them. Yeah. Because what? what? Since when are ideas things to commodify, not things to make the world a better place? But that shows you where we are as, as a human, to be like, my sole purpose is to amass at the expense of the other. Because a lot of these humans, they want to become, quote, unquote, immortal. <laughs> they want that as their legacy forever. It's like, even when they is, quote, unquote, gone, ah, oh, this is Jeff Bezos. All the, the Bezos is still running. You feel me? All that money is still running. Like the Rockefellers, you know what I'm saying? Like all that money is still running and controlling the world. The Buffets running and controlling the world. I mean, what what is the justification for the working class not having access, not reaping the benefits of their labor? Jeff Bezos don't deliver those packages. He not only assembly line. Elon Elon Musk don't, don't assemble them cars. He don't even go out and sell them. Like if we're talking if, about if, ideas, how would you just how would you justify? Yeah, like, if we're what, talking about ideas too, Tesla wasn't even his idea, <laughs> but he gets to control everything. Well, it's like what, what's what's the justification for these the elite, right? The folks who own the major corporations, who are the managers, who are the directors of these corporations, banks, and foundations. What's the justification of them? I, I'm trying to actually find one. Can you think of one? Like if you had to argue it. These niggas worship Satan. <laughs> That's all. It's some evil. Uh, it's pure evil. And why should one even aspire to that? Like, think about how how disconnected from the planet you got to be from fellow humans to be like, I want to make as much as I possibly can. I don't care how it impacts the world or how it impacts other people. I mean, if you can define a human being as someone that is... Uh, a breathing, living organism that finds connections and finds meaning and finds life from other human beings. If we can define humanity as that, mm-hmm. right, as like the interconnectedness of humanity, and these people will see themselves as essentially uh, godlike figures, which I would say they're Satanists, they is completely the opposite of humans. They are not human beings. If you have that much greed, that much... Uh, Obsession with destruction. That's all. That's why I say it's, it's pure evil. It ain't just about them reaping all these resources. Like you have to be an evil person to know that billions of people, millions of people are oppressed, and you get off to that, bro. And these that people is have a, a crazy form amounts of, of money. Narcissism. That's a form of just I don't know. I, like that's, I just can't. We talking about buku <laughs> money, bro. We ain't talking about like. These people have money. I don't think we ain't talking about somebody with a million, two million dollars. We talking about, about billionaires. We talking about the real capitalists. Like we ain't talking about five million, ten million. We talking about billionaires. You know what I'm saying? That's what we talking about. Who can give up five percent of their wealth and change the entire world? And then again, if we talking about the history of how a lot of these folks got their money, it wasn't under fairness. It was the exploitation of people. And so again, I'm not. I'm not exploitation in the enslavement. No, yeah. I'm not asking. People think socialism is the absence of hard work. Is handout. Nah, Julius and I already been told us. Nah, we're gonna have to work hella hard for what we want. And I'm down to work. I just want to reap the benefits of said labor. Yeah. That's I all. mean, a world where I, I mention this quote all the time: six of eight uh, people who are American control half of the world's wealth. So six, pe- eight people control half of the world's wealth, and we think that's fair. Like, well, like that is insane. That is completely insane. That's not fair. That is, like that. What are we talking about here? What are we talking about? That 
and six of them are American, and we know what, how the wealth of America was built off of transatlantic slavery, off of the genocide of indigenous people, off the genocide of African people, after uh, shadow slavery, after Jim Crow, after this prison industrial complex. And this is how they have their wealth. So it's like, we ain't asking for a handout, but we here for what's ours, nigga. We here for what's ours, and we're going to work hard to get that. And once we have that, we're going to keep working hard to develop humanity into a new way of being. To where you feel me? Yeah, it is that combination of work hard, but developing. You know oh, what I'm saying? Yeah. To actually make our lives as human beings the best it can be. Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to strive to be the best we can be as humanity. But this ain't it. Having a few people in control to dictate your your daily life and these few people are trying to lead you to a path of destruction so you destroy yourself so you enslave yourself nah man we that is contrary to existing as a human being mm -hmm. so we got to take away that parasite that doesn't want us to live we got to take away that parasite that doesn't want us to uh, see each other as a human family we got to remove that parasite from humanity because it's sucking us dry, taking everything, the resources, <laughs> our own soul, our own spirit, our own state of being day to day, our own mental health. That's, that's what neocolonialism is doing. Mm -hmm. Some of us, that parasite is so strong that we be thinking we free. <laughs> that's, that's the purpose of it. But this, this is all shit that this is all things that can be addressed. Uh, then the first step is just being able to identify what you're up against, understanding that you are in a neo-colonial situation, that your social, economic, and political interests uh, are not your own. Or even if you think you are by be, by participating in electoral politics, like what do you have to ask yourself? What do you really want as an individual? What do you want for the rest of humanity? And then ask yourself through the present situation, uh, does it present that as a possibility to come into fruition? Like, so if you say you want a world where healthcare is free, you say you want a world where house, everybody has access to housing, everybody has access to a decent education, clothes, food, shelter, all these things, you have to ask yourself, what is the system now that is preventing this from happening, right? You have to understand what capitalism is. You have to understand what colonialism is, what neo-colonialism is. You have to understand these things. That way you can start to fully address them because if you don't understand them, uh, the system will, will uh, take advantage of your lack of understanding. It will say, okay, you have come to think that white is what's wrong, so I'm going to put black in front of you and I'm going to run the exact same play. Okay, you have become you have become to think that gender is what's wrong, that the, that a man is what's wrong or a woman is what's wrong. Okay, so now I'm gonna put a trans person in front of you, but I'm still keep the same system in place. Okay, now you just, okay, let's put Asian in place, let's put a Hispanic in place. Let's, this all these things gonna, you gotta understand what the root cause is. What Yaki says, don't combat the shadow. Neo neo colonialism puts all these shadows in front of you, of, but the real problem here is capitalist imperialism, neo and neo colonialism, uh, capitalist imperialism in its in its last stage and. We have to organize to address it. Uh, it's part of cadres, educating the people, identifying the problems, and then putting real solutions and real proper programs in front of them. The electoral process as it currently exists, this is not true democracy. When you don't own the means of production, you don't own the resources, when they put in these uh, reactionary humanist shit in front of you, claiming that they care about human life, but all these things cost and have been commodified, right? These are things that we can't address. It just comes through organizing. It can be addressed, though. Yeah. And that's why we have to unite on principles. We have to unite on ideology. We have to unite on national consciousness of all of humanity. Right? Because if we look at neo-colonialism, it tries to confuse you. You feel me? It, it uses race, right? Like I say, like uh, the Europeans, they create a race. But we the ones who really be tripping off of it all the time. You know what I'm saying? Because they going to use a white man to get what they need. They going to use a brown person to get what they need. They going to use a black person to get what they need. They going to use an Asian person to get what they need. Because ultimately, all they see is green. Mm -hmm. But we over here set tripping over race. Because if we look at it, look at, if we look at the city of Oakland, District 7, Trevor Reed, black woman. District 6, Kevin Jenkins, a black man. Noel Gallo, District 5, Latinx. Janani Ramachandran, District 4, South Asian woman. Carol Fife, District 3, Black woman. Nikki Bass, Council President, and District 2, an Asian woman. Dan Cab, District 1, Euro American. 
Rebecca Kaplan at large, Euro American. <laughs> so out of all the council members, one, two, three, four, five, six, six out of eight are people of color. And when we we gonna do this, we gonna Shang do Shang Tao, the mayor, Asian. We gonna do an episode because the uh, the budget for the next two years goes out tomorrow. And when y'all see some of the stuff that's been proposed that I'm sure is gonna pass, recognize that it was these city council members who we just named to uh, pass them. So we have all these people of color in city council, all of these people in these seats making the decisions for Oakland, but we all yelling around white supremacy. <laughs> These are neo-colonialists doing the job for this Euro-American settler structure. And who's hurting the most? New Africans. The Latinx community. I just want to say this because people, this is not an attack on someone because of their gender, ethnicity, nationality. This is, we have to just call we have to point out capitalist, imperialist methods and the folks who either wittingly or unwittingly support them. Uh, you know, I just say that because every time we speak on objective facts, somehow we putting people in danger, we being anti-black. This ain't about race. This ain't, this is about calling pointing out contradictions that are a byproduct of capitalist imperialism. This ain't about gender, this ain't about sexuality. This is just like, yo, the fact remains that we want a city and ultimately a world where housing, education, quality of life are at the center of our society. I pay taxes, that's what I want. So all my tax dollars to go. Uh, and if a budget is passed again, where OPD has millions and millions of dollars and then spends another 70 million in overtime. If there's a budget where resources for houseless folks are being cut, like the Lake Merritt Lodge, where they wanna propose, where they're proposing closing 100 beds that serves mainly uh, black elders and black disabled folks, I have the right and the duty and the obligation to humanity to speak out and say, oh, who are the people that's allowing this to happen? That's all it's about. But because these people are black and Latinx and queer, you and can't Asian speak on it. You can't speak on Jewish it. Jewish. That's neat. That's how neo-colonialism functions. They put these people they use, who are this is fascism. They they want to use identity secretarian politics to be able to uh, give a buffer zone essentially for the neo-colonialism for the neo-colonialists to do exactly what they want to do. That's why we can't just say white. We can't just say white supremacy. You can't just say it's white supremacy, and you can't just say black is right, queer is white. Queer is right, trans is right, disabled is right. No, it ain't about that. It's about the politic you pushing. At the end of the day, <laughs> do you support righteousness has no color. Do you support sovereignty or do you support colonial subjugation? Do you do you support socialism or do you support capitalism? That's all. Do you support pan-Africanism or pan-Europeanism? That's that's what I have to ask myself. In a place that wants uh OPD to continue to have hundreds of million dollars at disposal, a place that's closing how uh Shelters that's cutting back resources for the people that's closing public schools. I gotta speak on that, man. But the message is understand neocolonialism because that's what we up against. Uh, neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism by Kwame Nkrumah is a great book to read. Uh, Meditations on Wretched of the Earth by uh, by Yaki, uh, The Wretched of the Earth um, by France Fanon. These are all some texts. Class Struggle by Kwame Nkrumah is a great book to read. It's four texts for you. I'm gonna just repeat them. Kwame Nkrumah, Neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism. Kwame Nkrumah, Class Struggle in Africa, France Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth, uh, James Jockey Sales, uh, Meditations on France Fanon's Wretched of the Earth are great books to read on neocolonialism. I would say for in terms of like very action-based book that addresses neocolonialism, none other than We Are Our Own Liberators. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. This is why we is discussing what we is discussing. You feel me? We pointing out we is trying to be able to identify it. Right. If we ain't able to identify the enemy and how the enemy uses our own our own people against us, we ain't gonna know, ain't gonna know how to fight. Right. So this is this process of class struggle is being able to identify who's for us and who ain't and drawing that line of demarcation to say, okay, these people, these people, they're on the side of our oppressors. 
And if they refuse to come and join the people, then we have to call them out for exactly what they're doing. It is what it is. You feel me? And this is why we build the programs in the heart of the community to struggle with our community to show people that, no, we can govern ourselves. We can liberate ourselves. We can build true power that is an offensive force that will ultimately free the land. That's what we have to do. We have to build these programs in our community to draw out these contradictions of capitalism, to draw the contradictions of neo-colonialism so that our people can be able to see, mm, yeah, these people we voted for, they ain't here doing it. They ain't here serving us week after week. They ain't in here in the projects with us building. They ain't over here trying to organize tenants. They ain't over here trying to make sure everyone has a right to food, housing, water. They ain't over here trying to make sure we have the right to be a dignified human being. And through that program, that's how we develop unity in our community. That's how we develop that national unity, new African unity. Because that new African unity, that's stronger than any type of weapon. That's the power of the program. Be able to identify our, our enemy and then create a material force to combat that enemy. And that's what we got to do. Throwing all forward. Free the land. How long was that?